Hi, everybody. Welcome to Walk Worthy. I'm Erin. And I'm Lindsay. And today we are going to be talking about idol worship. Mm -hmm. Would you say that is what the topic is? Idol worship. There are a lot of things in life that can be idols. And so we're going to really dig into the scriptures, see what God says about idols, how he feels about idols, and how we can make sure not to have those in our lives. So as always, let's give some context for what are idols. If someone's tuning in, maybe they're a new believer. What is an idol? What does that mean? You know, we hear American Idol, but... (laughs) You know, a right. little, little different, but maybe not. Well, maybe not. We'll get into that a little <laughs> bit later. Um, but there's a story in Exodus 32, and it's when Moses is leading the Israelites. Mm-hmm. And Moses goes up on, in, onto a mountain mm-hmm. to get the Ten Commandments from the Lord. And while he's gone, the Israelites basically, I don't know if they're bored or what exactly Something. it is, but they kind of feel like Moses is taking too long. Yeah. He's not coming back. Kind of afraid, maybe. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like maybe this, maybe this isn't who you're supposed to be following or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Hasn't really worked out how I thought. Yes. So but they go to his number two, Aaron, and say, come make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So yeah, they don't, they're like, he's not coming back. Make us a God. And so Aaron tells them to take all of their gold jewelry and everything. And he um, melts it down and builds it into this gold calf. Well, he throws it in the fire and he says, and out came this calf. Oh, right, right. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> I don't know how that happened. happened. It's so weird. First of all, which apparently Aaron is like a master sculptor or something. I'll make it into a cap. (laughs) Very strange. But yeah, so he does this and the people are dancing around and worshiping this thing. And God tells Moses up on the mountain, like, the Israelites. Yeah, you need to get down there. It's not going well. (laughs) They done lost their minds. Yeah. So (laughs) Moses comes down and. I believe he's so angry that he Mm -hmm. throws the tablets down and the Mm -hmm. story goes on from there. But essentially the people didn't trust God anymore because Moses wasn't coming back. It wasn't going how they thought it was going to go. And they just decided to build themselves something else to worship and worship something else. Yeah. So it's a very physical representation of what an idol is. Mm -hmm. And, um, but there are other things in our life, but just to give context of what an idol is, an idol is something you worship other than the Lord. Yep. And it could be anything. Mm -hmm. And the idols, sometimes I think we have this picture of an idol, a graven image, right? Something that we make and we think, well, we don't really do that. Well, our idols are different. And the idol themselves are not bad. Mm -hmm. You know, the calf, there was nothing good or bad about the calf, the golden calf. It It was just just like jewelry and stuff. Right. An item. So the problem with the idols, the reason that it is a problem is because of what happens in our own hearts. Mm -hmm. It's the devotion that we are owing the Lord that we begin to attribute to something or someone in place of worshiping the Lord. Mm -hmm. So the problem really is not the idol itself. So we're going to talk about some things that aren't the thing themselves. They are not necessarily bad, Mm -hmm. but the problem is the worship that we assign to those things in place of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So Ezekiel 14, I guess I, I like Ezekiel's description of this in 14. He talks about idols because Again, if we look at the golden calf, a lot of us think, well, I don't really have, yeah. I don't have candles lit to something. Yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't have that. Um, but he says, he's prophesying, or he's talking through Ezekiel, and it says in verse 3, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts and have put right before their faces the stumbling block of their iniquity. Should I be consulted by them at all? And so he indicates there that the problem of idolatry is really more of our heart than it is the actual thing that we're worshiping and that we have put up idols in our hearts. And I think that is more probably applicable to us today than Mm -hmm. the golden calf Mm -hmm. with, you know, worshiping and all of that. Yeah. And honestly, trickier because like you said, it's very easy to be like, well, I don't have like this shrine in my closet that I go pray to, but you know, those things sneak into our hearts. Mm -hmm. It's a very sneaky thing where we don't even really realize it's happening, which of course Satan would use an enemy. The enemy would use that if he can trick you into it. And it might not always be um, something particularly that we realize, but it's just priorities a lot of times Mm -hmm. where our priorities fall. Yeah. So we'll talk about some, but a good thing to ask yourself is – where do I spend my time and my money and my energy and my thought life? What is that consumed by? Is it mm-hmm. is it the Lord? Are we setting our mind on things above? Or are we consumed with all these things on earth? Uh, there are many things. Mm-hmm. It's not just one thing. So that's a question. Or another question I ask myself when I take inventory of my own heart and look at my own life is, if I look across the sca- landscape of what the Lord has given me, if it's a car or a house or my children or my husband, you know, whatever it is, my health, what is the thing if God touched it and he took it, 
that I would be mad and that would cause me to not be devoted to the Lord anymore. And that is evidence that maybe that is a place of idolatry in my heart. Mm -hmm. So there are some questions you can ask yourself, you know, what can God not have of mine? What would I withhold from him? Mm -hmm. What do I not hold with an open hand? Those are probably areas of idolatry. And we are people that are prone to idolatry. So this is not just you know, a certain person's problem or those people over there, we all in our own hearts are Mm -hmm. very prone to worship things other than the Lord. And so it's important for us to all ask ourselves these questions because we all do this in different ways. Well, and there are some sins where it might be something that like, I don't, I don't really struggle with that. I don't feel tempted to that. But idolatry is in the heart of man because Mm -hmm. we were made to worship. We were made to worship something. Yep. And, but we're also sinful. So we're going to mess that up and worship something else. Right. Other than the Lord. And it's one of those sins, like you said, some sins you gain victory from and others creep. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those ones, if you're not paying close attention to it, it just creeps back in in all kinds of subtle little ways. And you realize, wow, I'm worshiping something. I've placed something else in higher priority Mm -hmm. than the Lord. And you might go all down the list. Well, I I overcame that. I'm not idolizing that anymore. But here's something else that took its place. Yep. Um, So I guess let's talk about some of the things that we, in our day and age, Mm -hmm. what do we idolize what are some of the idols that so easily come in and take over i think the easiest one to look at is ourselves the comforts you know things our own pleasure you know we we want things easy we want things now we want Mm -hmm. things how we want it when we want it and that can become we start to serve ourselves in our own comfort and that can become an idol money you know vacations houses material things those are very Mm -hmm. easy to say yeah these are these are areas of idolatry and we need to guard against those things Mm -hmm. but they those are kind of i feel like the surface level idols, right and it doesn't even have to be like super fancy things for them to still be idolatry if there is a safety and a security and a trust that goes into those things Mm -hmm then that can become an idol. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a luxurious vacation right. or a really beautiful, crazy house or things like that. But it's about our heart because it's not about the thing. Yep. And it becomes the thing like if I can just get this thing, I'll be content. Yeah. And if I can and and we've assigned joy, we've assigned contentment, peace, security to something other than the Lord. Yeah. And that is an idol, mm-hmm. pure and simple. But it can be good things. You know, sometimes people really, really, really want to have children. Mm -hmm. And that becomes an area of idolatry because we feel offended that the Lord has not given us the ability to have children. And so it becomes an area of offense. And we don't say we, you know, it's not a heart of like, I'll bless the Lord if he gives it to me and I'll bless the Lord if he doesn't. It's I'll only bless the Lord if he does give that to me. And so we serve this idea or this desire for children more than we serve the Lord. And the same can be true of marriage. Yeah. You know, single people sometimes become fixated on I just want a husband or or I don't want a husband. I just want this career or, you know, whatever it is. But it becomes the be all end all of our happiness and our hope and our security and our future in this person, which is incredibly unfair to that person and is really an idol in our own hearts. Mm -hmm. That we need to be able to say, if God says no, if he never gives me children, if he never lets me get married, if he never gives me that job, if I never get that house, is he still good? Is he still worthy? Worthy and will I still praise him? Mm -hmm. Well, and to know in those moments that if the Lord is not giving you those things, it's not, it doesn't change the character of who he is Mm -hmm. and he is still loving and he is still kind and he does still have plans for you, but they just might be different. And so he's going to work that out in your life in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think it's okay too to have those desires. For sure. They're not ungodly desires to want to be married, to want to like experience that relationship, to have children, to experience that in life. It's not a bad longing, but again, God knows the plans that he has for us and to entrust that to him instead of trying to make our own plans happen. Right. And sometimes I think we can put our hands on in any, whether it's marriage, kids, our future, college, job, whatever, we can start to put our hands on the plans of our own life Mm -hmm. and we really mess that up. And that's where idolatry, we'll talk about this more later, but idolatry becomes a snare to us in some ways because we try to force things that the Lord hasn't given us at a certain time. And sometimes he's withholding one of our idols for our own good. There's a reason and there's a purpose and there's a plan behind it. But we try to force something because it's so much of an idol and we want it so badly and it becomes a disaster. Yeah. 
So there are other things, not just in our the physical things, not just family or those close relationships that we have, but there are other things in our culture that we can idolize. So what are some of those things that you would say that you see in the world today, oh people idolizing? I feel like I could, t we could talk for 30 minutes just on defining different idols. Yeah, because it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It really is. And we are a country of so many idols. Yeah. A big one right now is politics mm -hmm. and oh my goodness, which party is going to save us and which party is going to destroy us and yeah. which man is our savior. And, yeah. and it's sad. And people's whole security and peace is wrapped up in this transition of government. So for some people, you know, as president-elect Biden becomes inaugurated, or I guess by the time this airs, he, he will, will have be. been inaugurated. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so some for some people... Prior to that, you know, it's like we just need to get him in office and then everything's OK. And for other people, it's like we just need to keep Trump in office and then everything will be OK. Mm -hmm. For those of us that know the Lord, we are called to live a quiet and undisturbed life. Right. We are called to be at peace. And that is rooted. Our safety and our security is rooted in the Lord. Mm -hmm. So it really doesn't matter who's in power. If it's, you know, Democrats, Republicans, if some other crazy party comes to power, it doesn't matter. Our security is not in that. Our security is in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And we see people idolizing these different ideologies and parties and, and political people and they run about anxious and afraid mm -hmm. and tumultuous, chaotic, you know, there's no peace, there's no joy because we, we have <clears throat> made these things idols mm -hmm. in our hearts. Well, I think it's important to say too, being undisturbed in your spirit as a believer doesn't mean that your life doesn't get disturbed. It doesn't mean right. that things won't change. It doesn't mean that things might go how you don't want them to go. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why people get so worked up because they think well, it shouldn't be like that. Mm -hmm. Well, God never promised it was going to be easy. He said in this world, you will have trouble and that he didn't promise you your American rights. He didn't right. promise you all these things. He prom You need to read the Bible and see yeah. what he actually promised right. you. And he promised you a hope. He promised mm -hmm. you an everlasting kingdom. Yep. And you set your mind on him. And so I think sometimes we get so worked up because we think, well, this isn't how it's supposed to be. Well, God never said that. You're putting words in his mouth. Right. And so to really, truly be undisturbed, you have to be at peace that no matter what happens on this mm -hmm. earth, I wait for the blessed hope that is coming. Right. Whatever that means. Because my kingdom is not of this world. As Jesus said, he said, my kingdom is not of this, is not of this world. If we're in Christ, our kingdom is aligned with his kingdom. So yeah. our, my kingdom is not of this world. Yeah. And I, you know, of course, want peace. I want good. I want blessing and, and all the good things. But... My kingdom is undisturbed. It says mm -hmm. it is imperishable and it, it cannot fade away. It's undefiled. Mm -hmm. It's prepared for us, waiting to be, to be revealed when Christ comes mm -hmm. or when we pass away. It's held, it's safe, it's secure for us. So if that is what I truly believe, mm -hmm. then no matter what happens on earth, I can be undisturbed mm -hmm. because I trust that the Lord ultimately is God, that he's sovereign, that he's in control, that I cannot be snatched out of his hand. So what can man do to me? Yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> There's a song that it literally says, what can mere man do mm -hmm. to me? I love that. It's such like a strong promise. And just, you can like claim that, like, yeah. what are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> I love it. It's and if so I good. ultimately end up dying, then that's better exactly. for me anyways. There was a, I mean, there was a time in my life where I was like having, I feel like the Lord was growing me and I was realizing like, wow, like would I, you come to a point where it's like, would I really die for the mm. Lord? And I, there's that verse, like, if we live, we are the Lord's. If we die, mm. we are the Lord's. So it's whether we live or that, die, yeah. we are the Lord's. And if you can come to peace with that as a believer in Christ, that's right where you need to be. Like, yep. whatever happens, yeah. I'm going to be with the Lord. Like Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Yeah. You know, I, I have nothing to lose. I'm a Christian. So mm -hmm. I, I'm undisturbed. If the Lord truly is our source of peace, our source of security, mm -hmm. we're fine. It's yeah. okay. But when we make idols in man, when we make idols in political systems and man-made things, those idols will eventually crumble and shake. And we know when our security is wrapped up in them because all of a sudden we start to like, oh, I don't know, yeah. I don't know what's happening. But it's evidence that we have misplaced our worship and mm -hmm. misplaced our hope in something earthly that cannot save, cannot heal, cannot help. Mm -hmm. And I think that can happen in the church, too. It it's not just in politics. It's not just in celebrities or mm -hmm. things that we become, like, obsessed with and want to mm -hmm. know everything about. It can happen in the church, too, which mm -hmm. is very scary. Sad, yeah. And tears a lot of churches apart, tears a lot of churches down because man f men fail. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I guess let's talk a little bit about that. How does that happen in the church? Well, I think the church is an interesting place where we – 
we, to some degree, experience the Lord at church. When we're collectively worshiping, when there is the proclamation of the Bible, when you see other saints or believers that are walking as they're supposed to walk. I mean, there have been people in my life that I have been in awe of Mm -hmm. how they've handled certain situations or trials or difficulty. And I think we are called to show honor. I mean, the Bible is very clear. Show yeah. honor to whom honor is due. You should show honor to people. You should show respect. There, There is such a thing as mentoring relationships and people that help us in our walk. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. That's good. That's fine. Mm-hmm. But there's a fine line where that can cross over into worship. Yeah where we're expecting these people to be Christ. And then when they're not, then we're mad. Mm-hmm. When they, when we find out they're not perfect, we're upset. Well, you have put a mantle of perfection on somebody that they cannot carry. Mm-hmm. Or you have set them up on a pedestal. And then sometimes there isn't accountability because people are afraid to, you know, go against the leader. And, and that's yes. very sick and messed up. Yeah. <laughs> Cult-like. Cult-like. I mean, it really is. And and should there be honor? Should there be respect? Absolutely. But it, it shouldn't cross over into worship. And we have to guard our own hearts because, and sometimes people can fault the leader for that. Now, a leader can certainly cultivate that. You know, Absolutely. we see that happen in everyday life. I don't need to mention any names. Yeah. And, you know, and that's in the secular realm and the religious realm where people try to cultivate a following and cultivate worship mm-hmm. of themselves. That is sin in their own heart. But we need to understand that as people, we are prone to give that worship to somebody other than the Lord. Mm-hmm. And it could even be a good godly person that we respect and admire very much. Mm-hmm. It's not bad to admire those people. You know, we should have the humility to be encouraged. And, you know, sometimes people try to go the other way, like they're just people. Yeah. You know? Like they are, but we mm-hmm. should show them honor and respect and be encouraged by their walk. And, and allow God to use the gifting yes. that he's put in them to right. encourage us and edify the body. Right. Without be careful in our own hearts that it's not worship. Yes. Yeah. That's that can be a tricky one. Very tricky. Like Satan can use the very like your heart towards a leader, even in your church, yes. to make you not give the glory to God. Yes. Which is so There's tricky. A verse. Oh, I think it's in Mark. I can't remember exactly, but it has always stuck with me. I read it years ago in college, and it, it says, "We are unworthy slaves. We have only done our duty." And and that has always resonated with me. That no matter However God chooses to use me or any other person, ultimately at the foot of the cross, we are all unworthy slaves who are just doing our duty, discharging that to the Lord in mm-hmm. worship for what he has done for us. So as much as I appreciate and love my fellow believers in Jesus Christ, even ones that maybe have been given a national platform, uh, you know, we're all ultimately unworthy slaves who yeah. have only done our duty. And so often, sadly, in the church, we see sometimes big pastors who've been given a lot of influence fall. And when it causes our faith to falter, we know that we have entrusted that person with too much. We have, Mm -hmm. we have crossed over into worshiping that person and we have in some way married our faith to that believer. And it should be between us and the Lord. Now I grieve. I don't care who it is. I grieve when a national leader falls because that impacts the body of Christ that hurts the sheep, but it doesn't destroy my faith because my hope is not in that person. Yeah. That's good. Really good. I had something to say to that, but I can't remember what it was. I so. probably talked too long. <laughs> no, <why>. it's fine. <laughs> no, it was like so many stirring words. good thoughts in me, but then I, I can't come up with them. So maybe they were just for me. Um, <laughs> You'll remember also, them like tonight at midnight. Yeah. Like, Darn it. That's what I was going to say. Like, oh. We need to re-record. <laughs> um, but also we can seek to make idols out of doctrine as well mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. not truly follow what God said, mm-hmm. um, but really based upon like, you know, we talk about legalism a lot and people following the rules of the scripture, missing the heart. Jesus talked about that all the time. We can idolize those things over the truth of God's word. Yeah. And I don't even know if we always know that we're doing that, but we, there, even in my own life, there have been doctrines or things that I have been taught maybe growing up that I was taught this, you know, by a certain pastor or a Sunday school teacher or whatever. However, I came to believe what I believed that sometimes you kind of see the scripture confront it and you feel like, well, no, no, I was taught this. And yeah. this is what it's, and you, you hesitate to confront your own doctrine. Well, I have made that doctrine in some form an idol. I'm exalting that over what the Bible says. Mm-hmm. And it is a challenge sometimes to come to the scripture with fresh eyes and say, okay, regardless of what I have been taught, what does this say? And allow the scripture to speak for itself. Mm-hmm. But if we don't do that, then we are idolizing something above scripture mm-hmm. and it has become an idol and we can follow doctor doctrines and 
churches and denominations and leaders and we can take all of their words and all of their the things that they say and follow them so closely and fail to follow mm -hmm. the lord well and ultimately i kind of remember what i was going to say oh, before good. thank goodness <laughs> um ultimately those things and what we what we put our faith in religious leaders or false doctrines, they are ultimately shaping our view of the Lord. Yeah. You know, if we think that the Bible says a certain thing and this is a doctrine, but then we read and it's not really, well, you've changed the character of who God is. Yeah. And sometimes you might be confronted with something in scripture that's like, I didn't know God was like that. Mm. And so you're actually kind of making an idol out of a different, like yeah. you think you're worshiping out God, of the Lord, but yeah, you, it's not really him because you've mm. changed it with your false doctrine or you've changed it. Like when a religious leader falls, in yeah. sin or something like that like now you're viewing the lord differently because you were treating them like the lord so you're really mm -hmm. worshiping a false god but you think it's the real god right. if that makes sense it does so, and it's so this is what we were saying it's so sneaky and it's so subtle yeah. and it so easily seeps in and the bible says it adulterates our worship it defiles it it's yeah a mess. because it's not to the true god who mm -hmm. he really is yes. so important for us to know the bible and know who he really is i know mm -hmm. i've been confronted with things sometimes where i read it and i'm like Wait, my God's like that? <laughs> my God said that? <laughs> yeah. And you kind of have to get to a point where I might not understand that, but that I trust the word and I trust mm. who he is. Yes. And so if that is a part of who he is, then I trust that and I worship that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's tricky. It is tricky. <laughs> Just keep saying tricky. I don't tricky, tricky. tricky. <laughs> they're sneaky because yeah. they're satanic, really. And yes. Satan, because he wants to remove worship from the Lord. And he is sneaky. Yeah. You know, sometimes you just have to look at Satan and be like, respect. Like, you are <laughs> sneaky. Yeah. You know, like you are tricky in things that I think I should very easily call out and be like, hey, you know, every now and you get like halfway down the road and you're like, wait a second. <laughs> like, what in the world? Well, and two, we were kind of talking about this earlier, but. Satan has been using like the same tricks on humanity all these years and we're still falling for it. Still falling for it. We are so dumb sometimes. <laughs> yes, we are. We need to realize mm. our dumbness. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so obviously we've talked about how he, Satan wants to steal worship from mm. God. And so that is obviously something that idols stand in the way of. Uh, but also too, what else do they stand in the way of? Mm. It seems silly to ask, but why are idols bad? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, first, like we said, it's a, a misappropriation of worship. We are created to worship something in our souls and we assign that worship to so many physical things and to physical people. And the Bible says our idols cannot save. They cannot hear. They cannot help. Mm -hmm. You know, it talked in Psalms about they have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have eyes, but they cannot see all these different things. And we try to worship this thing, placing our hope in it that can't help us and we ultimately they ultimately rob us they become a snare to us the bible says and i think it empties us of hope and of faith and it it destroys us to some degree because we build something up that we think is going to save and then when it doesn't we are demoralized and depressed and the foundation of what we've built our life on is shaken and we don't know what to do and sometimes we don't even realize that we built it on a faulty foundation we just thought we had this life built and then it all falls apart and we think well god must really not be god and who is he anyway and, and how could this happen and we didn't realize that it was built from the beginning on the sand and so when the storm came and it washed that house away it was never founded on the rock but we accuse the lord of the sandy foundation but we made the lord the sandy foundation you know not the lord but we made yeah. the lord a sandy foundation that couldn't save you yeah. know it was it was our mistake mm -hmm. yeah i think sometimes too we can try to like have our idols alongside of god oh man yeah <laughs> we can try to do both mm -hmm. um like i love the lord and maybe maybe we are studying the scriptures maybe we are trying to like set our minds but if we're not paying attention to our hearts those things can creep in yeah. And it can't be both, though. You cannot serve God and man, or God and yeah. mammon. <laughs> it does to? say mammon, but it it's does talking say, about money, yeah. but it can apply to it other says things. you cannot have two masters. You'll yes, love the one yes. and hate the other. You'll serve the one and, you know, yeah. or hate the one and be devoted to the other or something. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and I think we're good at receiving salvation, but we're not always good at the Lord part. Yeah. You know, Christ as Lord, that, that doesn't, he doesn't share that. Like, mm -hmm. we can't. There, we can't have three kings in our life. You're going to yeah. serve one more than another. And the Bible calls us to serve the Lord first. And sometimes that's difficult. And sometimes that costs us something. And the reality is our flesh doesn't want to pay the price. Mm -hmm. And so we run from it and we think, I can still have the blessing of the Lord without the obedience. And it just mm -hmm. doesn't work like that. I think that if we could picture all the things that we idolize, all the things, even as much as our 
marriages or our children or families, mm-hmm. things that we love and it's okay to love. Mm-hmm. If we could picture our worship of those things as ridiculous as worshiping a golden calf, yeah, would we be so much more ready to cast those idols down because we'd be like, yeah, I love this person, but I'm literally worshiping something that cannot save me, Yes, that cannot be my hope, that cannot satisfy my longings. If we could see it like that because only the Lord can, because it's the same thing. Yep. It just in our hearts, it's harder because we do have affection for those things and they have mm-hmm. affection for us. Mm-hmm. But if we could see it, how God sees it, they're, they're the same. Yes. There's no difference. And it's unfair, particularly in cases where we are making idols out of our close relationships, our kids or our, our husbands or something. It's such an incredibly unfair burden to place on them. Sometimes you'll hear someone say, I, I want to have a child so that I have something that loves me. Well, you have a deeper need in your soul to be loved faithfully and unconditionally by something or someone well only god can satisfy that so you are going to have this child that's going to love you that that one day is going to grow up and have their own life and then Mm -hmm. where you will be just as shipwrecked only more so because you had this little baby that you couldn't keep a little baby yeah and and you'll be no closer to being loved than you were to begin with because Mm -hmm. you have tried to place that burden on a a human same with a you know a married you know I'll, i'll get married and then i won't be lonely well there are some women that are more lonely married than they ever were single because they wanted marriage so badly and they forced marriage they forced this person because they just felt like this was going to be the fix this is the thing and they get married to the wrong person they didn't wait for the lord Mm -hmm. to arrange that and it has become something that has taken from them instead of something that has added to them so our idols can become snares they can take from us rather than add to us yeah so how does god deal with idols i know we see god in scripture especially in the Old Testament, telling Mm -hmm. people to tear down their idols, or he says, I will destroy your idols. Mm -hmm. Um, I think of King Josiah that went through and just was tearing down all the idols. So we see that so much in scripture. But today, how does God deal with our idols? Boy, idolatry is scary because I think it is a direct challenge to the Lord. Mm -hmm. I think for those of us that know Christ, that are supposed to be followers of him, right? That when we worship idols, we cause his name to be profaned among the nations, the yeah. Bible says. And even among believers, you know, when we worship idols, we talked about maybe religious leaders that fall. I mean, man, does the name of God get slandered when someone falls and, and you know, it destroys the sheep. And, and I think God takes our idols as a direct challenge. I think sometimes he has grace for them for a little bit, mm-hmm. but once he reveals them to us, we are we're in a fight with the lord and he's asking us the question are you going to love that more than you love me and if the answer is like they tried to the israel israelites tried to do like i'll worship the lord i have the temple here but i'm gonna keep the Baal altars over here he is required i mean we're asking him to come and smash our idols Mm -hmm. which is especially if idols are those that we love like that's a dangerous thing for those people you know but ultimately we are he says that he is the lord and he will not share his glory with somebody else so we are we're we're challenging the lord in a match Mm -hmm. which is terrifying yeah (laughs) i don't want to do that no (laughs) i do not want to do that so you're if you continue to serve your idols you're asking for judgment you're asking yeah i mean it be and it's and it sounds very harsh Mm -hmm. it sounds like why would the lord smash my idol but i love what it says in Ezekiel 14, it tells us why. It says, let me turn to the right page here, um, that he, it says, Son of man, these these men have set up idols in their hearts and have put right before their faces the stumbling block of their iniquity. Should I be consulted by them at all? So it indicates that our idols make a separation between us and the Lord, which mm-hmm. is dangerous for us. We lead ourselves into all kinds of sin when we're not walking right next to the Lord. And then it says that he will answer the people. And in verse five, it says, in order to lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel who are estranged from me through all their idols. Mm -hmm. The point is not because he's trying to be unkind or because he's trying to be cruel or because he's mad or insecure. Or an egomaniac. Yeah, like you love that more than you love me. It's not that. It's because he knows that our idols are a snare. You know, think of of Samson who had this woman, right? And his parents tried to warn him, uh, you know, like, should you be hanging out with her? And he's like, ah, oh, she looks good to me. Go get her. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So he does. And she becomes a snare. Delilah becomes a snare mm-hmm. who ultimately is the reason that he has his eyes gouged out, ends up a slave and dies. And mm-hmm. I think that is the end of our lives as an idol, as idol worshipers, that they become a snare to us in multitude of ways. But mm-hmm. the Lord 
smashes them for our own good in order to lay hold of our hearts. I think that's such a cool picture. Yeah. Because he wants our hearts. Mm -hmm. And it ultimately comes from love. Yes. Not all those other things, you know, not selfishness. Like, oh, I'm God. Worship me. I mean, he can. (laughs) I used to struggle with that. Like, why does God get to be so prideful? Like, he's God. (laughs) They worship me. (laughs) No, I really used to think that. Praise the Lord for not. (laughs) Praise him for his grace and allowing us to grow. Dear Um, heavens. But really, like, because he loves us and he Mm -hmm. wants our hearts. And so that is really, when you look at it like that, just because God does have judgment for sin, but he Mm -hmm. also genuinely loves and cares for each of us Mm -hmm. and wants that relationship and wants our worship and wants that closeness with each Mm -hmm. of us. And that's really beautiful. And I think we can struggle with what is written in this book sometimes. Sometimes we're called, the reality is we are called to things that are very hard. We're called to forgive our enemies. We're called to not be bitter. We're called to not slander. We're called to not be angry. We're called to be pure in our relationships till marriage. All these different things that seem like, really, do I have Mm -hmm. to do that? And the reason is that we are the most blessed. We are the most at peace. We have the most joy when we do it his way. Abundant and life. Abundant life. I mean, this is it. And people sometimes, I said earlier, people will see pieces of the abundant life in a believer's life and say, you know, I want that peace. I want that abundant life. Well, but you're not willing mm-hmm. to make God king. You're not willing to make the Lord Lord of your life and master. You're not willing to follow what he's called you to follow. You want all your idols and you want the abundant life, but it does not work that way. And so the Lord smashing our idols really is him trying to give us the abundant life that he's promised to us Mm -hmm. by getting rid of the things that are snares to us, getting rid of the things that rob our peace and our joy and allowing him to be God, because that is the best way. Mm -hmm. Well, and like you said, we miss out on the blessing when we serve idols because they cannot save because they cannot do any of those things. They certainly can't bless, right? which is what the Lord does. And so we miss out on that closeness with him, the relationship with him, him using us, making Mm -hmm. us effective because we're running around serving idols that can't do anything for us. Right. And that ultimate hole in our soul cannot be filled by anything earthly. Mm -hmm. It has to, it's a, we have a spiritual soul. It has to be filled with something spiritual. Mm -hmm. So what do we do about them? We've talked a lot about them. Maybe mm-hmm. somebody is sitting there thinking and they know what it is. They know yeah. what the thing is. Yeah. What do we do about it? Well, Ezekiel, this, I, you should read this part in Ezekiel. It's just the first eight verses. In Ezekiel, it tells us that we should, the Lord is speaking to Israel and says, Resent, repent and turn away from your idols and turn your faces away from all of your abominations. The first thing that we need to do is repent. Mm-hmm. We need to recognize that we have, elevated something to the place of worship above the Lord. And there should be a brokenness over our Mm -hmm. sin, a repentance, you know, and and a decision to not go back there. Mm -hmm. Now, we need the Lord. We fall. We're not perfect. But there should be a resolve in our own hearts that I am going to fight to keep the Lord my first love. And it's a fight because it creeps in. It's easy to lose. But that should be something that we purpose in our heart to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's easy you said first love that made me think of mm-hmm. revelation and the mm-hmm. church that he's talking to when he talks about you've left your first love they were doing all the things they should have been yep. doing he had a lot of good things to say about the church that they were calling out false doctrines they were doing things like that but they weren't they didn't have the lord as their first mm-hmm. love and so we have to be really mindful of that because you can be doing all these things but there's maybe even those things that you're doing have become your idols mm-hmm. over who the Lord truly is in your life and mm-hmm. that relationship with him. Yeah. And I think we need to hold, we need to take an honest inventory of our life, an honest look at ourselves, and we need to hold everything with an open hand. Abraham and Isaac is another great story where Abraham had been given this promise by the Lord that he was going to have a child. So you can imagine that would be something that you're clinging to. This promise, yeah. God's promise. And, and it's a good thing. It's promised by the Lord. Yeah. And we should trust his promises. And we should trust his promises. Yeah. yeah. And but you wonder if at some point did this become the thing, you know, that and Abraham, you see him try to put his hands on it and fix it for himself. Mm-hmm. Well, with Sarah, you know, like, OK, we'll take my maidservant and have a child Ishmael. And that yeah. has become a disaster to this day right. because Abraham tried to make that happen and you see the lord finally give him isaac and he realizes this is the the promised son and you wonder did that become in his own heart a temptation to worship that this is what the lord finally gave me i waited for this for all these years Mm -hmm. and and it's a good thing it's a child it's it's wonderful it's blessed but the lord tells abraham you need to go up to the mountain and you need to sacrifice and you Mm -hmm. watch him go 
with resolve. It doesn't say he goes up weeping. It doesn't say he's like, oh, God's asked me to do this. You know, he takes his son. His son doesn't obviously even know anything about it. His Mm -hmm. attitude is so purposeful that he's going to go obey and do this. And Isaac is with him. And it's not until they get to the mountain where Isaac asks don't we need the lamb like don't we need a lamb to sacrifice and and his answer is that the lord will provide for himself and it is not until isaac is bound and on the altar and abraham has his hand raised to kill his son that the lord stops him because Mm -hmm. that was what it took till the lord knew really knew that he was willing to kill his son and that it was you know sometimes we think this is a strange story what it was about was the devotion in his heart where is the devotion and our attitude towards these things if it's something that we want or something that we have you know it could be a house it could be a job it could be a future of some kind of relationship should be if i should be able to hold this with an open hand that if the lord takes it from me Mm -hmm. blessed be the lord if he gives it to me and lets me keep it blessed be the lord not without pain not without struggle there are some things that he in his sovereign wisdom takes like he decides you know to take and we have to still decide in our own hearts, is he still good? Is yeah. he still faithful? Is he still worthy of worship? Yeah. And those are hard things. They don't, like you said, they don't come without pain. They don't come without struggle. Mm-hmm. But he is still good. And Abraham considered that moment on the mountain where he was ready to sacrifice the thing that he loved the most to the Lord. He considered that worship. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So if there are things, what are practical steps that people can take in their life to rid their lives of those idols that maybe... Mm-hmm. You know, first of all, they need to ask the Lord to reveal what they are. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's someone watching that is like, oh, I don't have any idols. I mean, chances are you probably do. We all <laughs> at one point or another do. Um, but to really ask the Lord to reveal those to your heart. But then what? The Bible tells us to flee from them. Mm-hmm. You know, so if there's an area where, you know, and, and the Lord will, he's so good. He's so gracious to reveal to us our own sin. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you need to ask the Lord. But when he does reveal those things to you, you know, let's just, an easy one is, let's say, a husband, somebody that really wants a husband. You know, there are some women who really are seeking this relationship, and they spend so much time looking at wedding dresses and planning for this wedding and looking for that. You're feeding this idol that the Lord may or may not ever give you. That would be an area that would be very easy to just flee from the idolatry and and purpose in your heart. Lord, if you give this to me, fine. And if not, fine. I am going to wait to you know, do all this planning until Mm -hmm. you reveal the person that I'm supposed to be married to, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and to take that time to seek the Lord, to Mm -hmm. replace that time with seeking him and truly giving him the worship he deserves, that will help as well. Mm -hmm. And make you maybe, if the Lord chooses to bless you, make you more of a better wife than you would have been before because you haven't been spending your time worshiping the idols of a wedding Mm -hmm. or those things that we don't know may never happen, but mm-hmm. you've become who you needed to become right. because you've spent time with Man, the true Lord. <laughs> and I think we waste so much time looking for something that we don't have and being discontent mm-hmm. with what the Lord has given us and not using the time that he has because we're waiting for a future yeah. day. And I think we should get busy serving the Lord. We should flee from idols and we should guard ourselves against the areas that we know are weakness, that we are prone to idolatry. Mm-hmm. I think another thing that helps too is just having people in your life that because we've talked, I mean, we said over and over how sneaky idolatry can be. Mm. And so when you do recognize an idol in your life and you want to get it out of your life, you want to get rid of it, but it's something that you care about. So it's going to, it might start to creep in again. The enemy's mm-hmm. not going to let you off that right, easy, you right. know? So to have people in your life that you can tell about that, that you can say, I need you to like, watch out for me. I need you to tell me. And then mm-hmm. being willing to hear being it. Willing to hear. When those right. things sneak back in. It says in James, to confess your sins one to another so that you can, will be healed. Mm-hmm. To be like, this is what I'm struggling with and I'm going to need your help to overcome it. Right. You don't have to do it on your own. We weren't meant to like do everything on our own. And so to have that in your life to yes. call you out if you need yes. it. And then having the humility to be like, you're right. You're right. I was doing it again. Yep. I'm going to put it aside yeah. and seek the Lord. And those are hard things to do. But if you really are serious about casting the idols down, then you'll be willing to do it. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that. That's that. that. (laughs) Go smash your idols before God does. I mean, truly, (laughs) truly. I hope that this was helpful to you. It's like a weird word to use because I'm hoping that it came with great conviction. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that God will use it to maybe show you some areas of your life that you 
are worshiping something else other than him and putting in place of him so that you can cast those aside and seek him and allow him to do a mighty work in your life. So I pray that he will use this for you and we will see you next month. Until then, walk worthy.